Garrett. Mm -hmm. So the Harris campaign kicked off the Fighting for Reproductive Freedom bus tour to support the fundamental right for women to make decisions about our own bodies. And here is a short tape on that. I did something that nobody thought was possible. I got rid of Roe v. Wade. After Roe v. Wade was overturned, Tennessee put forth a ban immediately that banned all abortion with no exceptions. Abortion bans are not for life. They are pro-poverty and pro-inequality. It's been over two years since a five to four ruling by the Supreme Court ended Roe v. Wade, the landmark case that provided nearly 50 years of abortion rights across the United States. Since then, abortions have been banned in over a dozen states. Many women and doctors say the limits on reproductive rights have forced them into unimaginable situations. These policies do not reflect evidence-based medical practice. They do not keep my patients safe. According to the gender equity policy, women who live in states where abortion is banned are up to three times more likely to die during pregnancy, during childbirth, or soon after giving birth. I nearly died all because of Donald Trump's Supreme Court justices overturning Roe v. Wade. So for the millions of you who watched the Democratic National Convention, you will remember Hadley Duvall telling her incredibly powerful story. And in case you didn't see it, here's just a brief look. Growing up, I was an all-American girl, varsity soccer captain, cheerleading captain, homecoming queen, and survivor. I was raped by my stepfather after years of sexual abuse. At age 12, I took my first pregnancy test, and it was positive. Hadley is here. Stand up, Hadley. standing up because we are so impressed by your courage to stand up and share your story. Where did that come from, the strength to, to do this? Because I'm sure you thought long and hard before deciding to go public with your story. When Roe v. Wade was overturned, Thanks, everybody. I woke up with a harsh reality of my abuse was over, but my story is not. And I just could not fathom thinking about the other Hadleys out there that don't have that choice, that don't have somebody to go to. So being able to find courage and be the light for them, that's, that's really what I do it for. And so what do you want to say to other people who are voting in this election regarding what happened to you and what that means? You can't wait until it's too late to care about reproductive health care because then it, it's too late. And when it affects you, it, it, it hits. And it, you can't deny it. You can't look at someone with a story like mine and say it didn't happen. And there are more people like me out there. And there are going to be so many more who deserve their options. They deserve their choices. Let's get involved. We have someone who's willing to hear us at a level like never before. We have someone who wants to know what we want in this country. We have someone who wants to lift up our voice. And we need to show out and show up for her just like she's showing out and showing up for us. All right. There's something you wanted to say to Madam Vice President. Madam Vice President, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for seeing us, for hearing us when the Supreme Court won't. Thank you for fighting and, you know, really showing us that life is, is not about the hard things that you go through. You don't bow down, That's even right. when you're the underdog, especially when you're the underdog. Right. You stand up and you stand tall, and you give me so much hope and so much strength, oh, and thank Hadley. you. Thank you, Hadley, for coming all this way. I hope you continue to use your voice. I hope you continue that. This week, the case of a young woman who lost her life after the abortion ban took place in Georgia. 
made national headlines. Amber's case came to light through the reporting of journalist Kavitha Serana uh, with uh, Pro, ProPublica. And so listen to her story. Two years ago, 28-year-old Amber Nicole Thurman, a medical assistant and a single mother to a six-year-old boy, found out she was pregnant. Amber had just secured her own apartment and was thinking about going to nursing school. She made the decision to terminate her pregnancy. A strict abortion ban had recently taken place in her home state of Georgia, which caused Amber to travel to North Carolina for the procedure. Traffic made her miss the appointment, so the clinic gave her medication, what are known as abortion pills. Once back home, Amber experienced profuse bleeding, vomiting, severe pain. She eventually passed out. Her boyfriend called for an ambulance. At the Georgia hospital, Amber's condition deteriorated quickly. In a rare occurrence, it was discovered her body had not expelled all the fetal tissue and an infection was spreading. Official Georgia state medical expert analysis of her case says Amber should have received a life-saving DNC, but doctors waited 20 hours before deciding to take her to surgery. Amber's blood pressure had taken a dive. Her organs had started failing. In the operating room, her heart stopped. On the way to surgery, Amber's last words to her mother were, promise me you'll take care of my son. Amber's mother, Shanette, and older sister, CJ, and Andrika are here, and they are, they wanted to be here tonight uh, to speak out for the first time. Ms. Shanette, what do you want us to know about Amber's story? Initially, I did not want the public to know my pain. I wanted to go through in silence. But I realized that it was selfish. I want y'all to know Amber was not a statistic. Mm. She was loved by a family, a strong family. And we would have done whatever to get my baby, our baby, the help that she needed. When ProPublica came to my home, I pushed them away. No, no, no. But Kavithia, she kept, she was persistent. She said, it was something that you needed to know. You have to hear me. Women around the world, people around the world need to know that this was preventable. Two years later, after speaking with my daughters, because I lost strength, I lost hope, you're looking at a mother that is broken. Mm -hmm. The worst pain ever that a mother, that a parent could ever feel, mm -hmm. her father and myself, and the family, you're looking at it. Well, we appreciate so deeply you being here. And I, we're all watching you hear that tape and those words. We know how re-traumatizing that is and the strength it takes for you to be here to tell your story. And we deeply appreciate it. And I have to ask you, uh, as her sisters, how are you coping? And what does knowing that this could have been prevented um, how does how does that sit with you? How do you cope with that on a daily basis? I mean, it's heartbreaking. You know, that was my baby sister. I love my baby sister, you know. Um, I'm beyond hurt, um, disappointed. I feel guilty. I wish I could have helped her, you know, because she was suffering. Mm -hmm. And we had no idea. We trusted them to take care of her, you know. Mm -hmm. And they just let her die because, because of some stupid abortion ban. They treated her like she was just another number. Mm -hmm. They didn't care for her as if, you know, she was their daughter or their, you know, granddaughter. Yeah. You know, and she's not here. She'll never come back. Yeah. Andrika, what do you want to say? 
I want to say that it's, it's very disheartening that my sister was allowed to suffer for 20 hours. She suffered. It was nothing that we could do to help her. We trusted the healthcare professionals to do their job and save her, but they failed her. Well, I think the most powerful thing that you've said here, Ms. Jeanette, is that your daughter is not a statistic. She had a life. She was loved by her sisters, loved by her family, loved by those who knew her, and she's not just a statistic. And we are happy to speak her name tonight in, in this room talking about what this country needs in terms of reproductive rights and freedom. What do you want to say, Madam Vice President? I'm just so sorry. Um, and the courage that you all have shown is extraordinary because also you just learned about how it is that she died. And they just recently learned. Yes. How? Yeah. 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 And, um, and Amber's mom shared with me that the word over and over again in her mind is preventable. Yeah. Preventable. That word keeps coming to her. Mm -hmm. And this story is a story that is um, sadly not the only story of what has been happening since these bans have taken place. And, um, you know, so the, just to step back in terms of how we got here, the former president chose three members of the United States Supreme Court with the intention that they would overdo the protections of Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. And they did as he intended, and in state after state, including yours, these abortion bans have been passed that criminalize health care providers. In a couple of states, prison for life, Oprah. Prison for life in a couple of states for a doctor or a nurse who provides health care. And so it, it, it seems very apparent even that... When the, even when the mother's life is in danger. But see, here's the problem with that. Here's the problem with that. So is she on death's door before you actually decide to give her help? Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Is that That's what we're saying? Yeah. That you've got to that, prove you're on death's like, door. Like, literally, a doctor or a nurse has to say, she might die any minute, better give her now care. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise I might go to prison for life in some cases. Mm. Think about what we're doing in terms of saying that Certain people who are in these state houses and then starting with the former president of the United States think they're in a better position than a doctor or a nurse to determine when their patient needs medical care. This literally, and, and Amber's story highlights the fact that among everything that is wrong with these bans and what has happened in terms of the overturning of Wade, Roe v. Wade, it's a health care crisis. It's a health care crisis that affects the patient and the profession. And going back to Hadley's story, and Hadley, you've been so remarkable you. in telling your story and being so strong in the way you do it. And both of these stories really, I mean, the courage for it out of pain. But when I was in high school, I learned that my best friend was being molested by yes, her stepfather. Yes, we heard that story on the on the DNC. Yeah. Yes, yes. And and, and you I had the courage her, then to go to her and say, you "You've got to come to our house." Come, yeah, you and she gotta. came to stay with us. I called my mother. She came to stay with us. And the idea that these same legislators who would be saying, you know, criminalize healthcare providers, are also saying that 
after a person's body has been violated, that they have no right to make a decision about what happens to their body next? That's immoral. Yeah. I think it's not just immoral. And here's, 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 here's what I want to say. I just don't believe that those legislators, that the government has a right to be in your womb. They have no right to be in your womb with decisions about your womb. And one does not have to abandon their faith. Right. Or deeply held beliefs to agree the government should not be telling her what to do. Absolutely. Right? If she chooses, she will talk with her priest, her pastor, her rabbi, her imam, but not the government telling her what's in her best interest. Mm. Well, this is a long healing process for this family. And we thank you and we hope that by being amongst people who heard you and heard your daughter's story will be meaningful to you in this journey to healing. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, I want to also...